loss and change and other tales from the quarantine. Our speaker today is Julia Elifrit. Julia is a licensed independent social worker with extensive experience in the fields of hospice and bereavement care. With that brief introduction, I will turn over the presentation to Julia. Thank you. Well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about how we as professional caregivers are managing grief and loss during this global pandemic of COVID-19. It's really changing you know, all of our lives and how we're doing things, living and working. So while this new reality is something that our country hasn't experienced in a very long time, I've been a bereavement counselor for 35 years and have seen all kinds of grief and loss and the lasting ensuing change that can happen as a result. And although we're living in this working in an unprecedented times, it's affecting every area of our lives, our work, our home. In spite of all that though, the loss of our workplaces as we know them and the loss of our home life as we know it, we're survivors and we move forward with hope. So we're gonna begin our program and there'll be time for questions at the end. So if you haven't, I think you can go ahead and type them out and we'll answer those at the end. So our objectives today, first one is just to talk a little bit about grief, grief and loss. Grief is something that 100% of us experience. Um, every single one of us on the planet experiences grief. As they say, the world statistics on death are still trending at 100%. So if you have already been born, it is too late. We are all going to, to have people that uh, in our lives that die, clients, family members, friends. We all experience loss, 100% of us. Then we're going to talk about the COVID-19 crisis in the sense of how it is changing us as professional caregivers, the work that we do, what it's doing to our caseloads, to our mental health, to our capacity. Let's we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to finish up with just a quick little bit on self-care, how we survived this whole um, concept of doing more with less, of seeing more and more loss, of having, I know for a lot of you that are working in the renal field, you know, your, your regular patients that you take care of have been moved and you're having COVID-19 clients and patients in your facilities instead. And so there's just lots of loss that goes along, along with that. We wanna talk about how you're caring for yourself during that time. I would like to start with something fun just because it's a heavy topic. So I, I found this and I love it. Just back from our cruise, had a great time. And you can see the sunburn of their masks there. So with that being said, let's start. Start off. You know, I've heard this phrase for a long time. If a tree falls in a forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it really make any noise? The concept being that um, noise only happens when a wave hits our eardrum. So if there's nobody in the forest, does a tree really make a sound? So I was thinking about that the other day. I'm thinking, you know, I'd like to go to TJ Maxx. That's my kind of stress relief. And I can't do that now because all the stores are closed. So if no one's there to smell the pretty candles at TJ Maxx, are they still fragrant, right? But more importantly, if I wasn't able to have a funeral for my loved one because of everything that's going on now, will they still be remembered? And the answer to that is, of course, we're just having to do things differently. If people are unaware of my daily sacrifices as a healthcare professional, is my work still important? Absolutely, a thousand percent it is. And really, you all on the front lines are the ones that are the heroes in this whole pandemic. I love this visual because all of the Marvel superheroes and uh, Spider-Man and Batman, they're bowing to you all. You're the heroes. You are the ones that are, are moving uh, the needle on this whole pandemic. You're saving lives. You're helping people. You're right on the front lines. So you all, even if nobody sees it, even when the people that are out there, you know, going to the parks and congregating and not wearing masks, all the things that they're not supposed to be doing, even if they do that, you are still valuable and your work is so important. So I just wanna start by thanking you for that. There's actually four types of losses that we all experience and we all experience all four of these. First one's a developmental loss. Now, if any of you have tried to wean a two-year-old from a pacifier, you understand what a developmental loss is. Because is that two-year-old happy about that process? No, they usually aren't, right? Developmental losses happen from the moment we're born to the moment we die. It's just how our bodies change over time. So when you go through adolescence and puberty and, 
you're feeling awkward and your voice changes and your face breaks out. Those are developmental losses. I turned 50 many years ago and I have to wear the little reading glasses now to be able to see anything. Um, if you've had hearing loss, if you've had a stroke and you have difficulty walking, through our whole life we have developmental losses. We all experience them. The second type of loss that we all experience is just material possessions, just stuff. You lose your car keys, somebody steals your purse, um, it's just stuff. The third type of loss that we all experience is some aspect of self. And those are really hopes and dreams kind of losses. Those are, um, I always dreamed of making it big in Hollywood. Well, if I didn't, um, that's a loss that I have to grieve. If I dreamed of getting into Harvard Law School and I didn't, at some point I have to grieve that that didn't happen for me. And how many boys uh, think they're going to be the next LeBron James? Well, lots of them. How many are really going to be? Probably none of them or maybe one of them. But if that's a dream that you have, we have to grieve all those dreams, those aspects of ourselves. Um, if you dreamed of growing old with your spouse and being in the rocking chairs on the front porch and your spouse was killed by a drunk driver when he was 30, uh, that's, that's a loss of a dream that you have. Again, if you uh, have a, a child and you dream that they're going to grow up and be a doctor and find a cure for the COVID uh, response thing uh, and they die of SIDS, the, the, all those things that are hopes and dreams are a huge part of what we have to grieve. And then the last type of loss that we all experience at some point is death, the loss of a loved one. What we want to focus on really in this next few minutes that we have together is the losses that we experience, some aspect of self and death, because those are the two things that are on the forefront of everybody's mind, of everybody's job experience right now in healthcare is, is the loss of the workplace as we knew it, the loss of, you know, um, typical days, the loss of having our kids being in school and we having to homeschool them. And then if we're seeing lots of deaths, I'm hearing from a lot of people that work in hospitals that in nursing facilities, they would have one death a week, two deaths a week, but now they're having 10 and 12 a day. And so just that cumulative loss is, is huge right now. So what are some things that make how we process these losses and how we grieve, because grief is your response to a loss, what makes how we grieve different from each other? Um, because there's not one right way to do this. There's some variables in grief. And so I just want to go through some of them fairly quickly. The first variable in this process is the nature of the loss, like what that loss means to you. So an example I'd like to give is if I went to the doctor and they said, Julia, you've got a bad heart. You should never ex exercise again. I would say, thank God, I hate to exercise, right? But if you are an avid exerciser or a marathon runner or an athlete and you were told you couldn't exercise, that would be devastating to you. It's the same loss. The question is, what does that loss mean to you? That's really important as we go through this process. The next variable in how we grieve differently is how we cope. You know, there are people that, you know, they like survive these insurmountable things and you think, wow, they're like a rock. They, they cope with anything, and then you've all known people that, you know, they get a hangnail and that ruins their day. So how we cope is going to make a huge difference in how we get through all this. Um, internal and external processing. There are some people who grieve very privately. Um, they, they cry, they'll talk to a friend, but they're not, they're not, not out there with it. They're just a very, uh, very private. Then there are people who are external. They're talking to everybody, and they're going out, and they're processing on a different level. So how we process that. Culture is also very important in all this. And what we know about culture is that if you are allowed to grieve in a way that's appropriate for your culture, you're going to get through this process a lot better than if you are forced to do something different. So for example, a lot of times in funeral homes, the, the Eastern European cultures, many of them are very stoic in their grief. And they just kind of have a stiff upper lip. And if you are at a funeral home visiting your friend, because let's say a parent died, and they're very stoic, and you said, you know, Mrs. Smith, you just need to cry and let it all out, you just kind of messed up her grief for her because that's not how they do it in their culture, right? They, they hold things in. There's a lot of cultures, many Latino cultures, that are very demonstrative. They wail and cry and throw themselves on the casket, and, you know, they're very much external processors. And if you said to somebody like that, you just need to sit quietly and respectfully in the front row, you messed up their grief. Because again, what we know is that if you can grieve the way your culture says is appropriate for you, you will get through that process a little bit easier. 
sudden versus expected. This is something that I get asked a lot. Which is harder, to lose your loved one suddenly because of a car accident or a suicide or a, a, a massive heart attack or expectedly, meaning that they uh, had a life-limiting illness, they were in hospice, they, you knew that they were going to pass away. It really, the, you know, the answer is they're both difficult. They're, they, there's not one that's easier or harder than the other. There, there are different issues, though. They're different things that they bring to the table. If you know somebody is going to die, you have the opportunity to say some things like, you know, Mom, we're going to take good care of Dad, so whenever you need to let go, you, you go ahead and let go. You know, I love you. I'm sorry I was a jerk when I was in high school. You know, where'd you hide the money in the Cayman Islands? You can ask a lot of things if you have the opportunity to ahead of time. But what I would submit to you is that just because you have the opportunity to doesn't mean that you always do it. I worked in hospice for a lot of years, and there were plenty of patients who were in hospice. They had to sign a do not resuscitate, a DNR order. They signed papers saying they knew they were in hospice. They had less than six months to live. But they really didn't think they were going to die. I had one uh, young man in particular, he was 30, and his wife really believed God was going to heal him and he wasn't going to die. And she wouldn't let him take his pain medicine because God can't heal you if you're taking your pain medicine. And as much as I would say, you know what, let's, God could do anything, let's just let him take his pain medicine and be comfortable, she wouldn't. And he died a very, very painful, horrible death. At the funeral home, she said to me, Julia, why didn't anybody tell me he was dying? If I'd known he was dying, I would have done things so much differently. And, you know, I would never say this because I'm a decent human being, but the bubble over my head was, oh, my goodness, we try telling you every day. She just was in such denial. She just believed that he wasn't going to die. So if you asked her, did you expect the death to happen, she would say, nope, totally caught off guard, even though he was in hospice, he'd signed all those consent forms. So, again, just because you know somebody it's going to, that doesn't mean you had to take the opportunity to process it. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but I lost on that. Sudden versus expected. Uh, they're not, it's not that one's hard and the other, they're just, they're just different, different issues. Anticipatory grief is being able to grieve ahead of time before somebody dies. And so it's kind of just what we were talking about with hospice, if you have the opportunity. Um, people who have, lose a loved one to Alzheimer's, so many times I hear people saying, well, Mrs. Smith didn't look real sad that her mom was died, um, but maybe Mrs. Smith has grieved every day a little bit for five years, and she took care of her mom who was dying of Alzheimer's disease. So when the death happens, it's almost a relief. You know, as, as hard as that sounds, it's almost a relief. And so if you've done some of the grief ahead of time, you're not going to have that same intense response uh, when, when you weren't prepared for it. Concurrent stresses, these can be good things. You could be planning your wedding at the time that grandma's dying, and so uh, that adds to the, the stress of grief. Perceived support system, I put the word perceived in it because it's always about what the client feels. If you feel like you have support, man, you can get through anything in life better than if you feel like you're all alone. So that's definitely something that we assess for. And then the last one is disenfranchised grief. Disenfranchised grief is grief that we can't talk about because it's socially negated. So for social reasons, um, it's kind of a taboo thing, that the type of death or the type of loss. So some examples would be, um, the example I always use is if I'm having an affair with a married man and he dies, am I welcome at the funeral? You know, clearly not because nobody knows who I am. Um, I always out now, though, give this caveat that I am not having an affair. I, somebody wrote on an evaluation once. You shouldn't have affairs with married men. And I thought, no, it was just an example. So now I tell everybody, just an example. Um, if I had an abortion, you know, people say, well, um, you know, you picked that, so why are you sad? It's a devastating loss for people to process. Ariel Castro's mom, um, for those of you who may not live in the Cleveland area, Ariel Castro was a gentleman that held three women captive for 10 years and tortured them. Um, and he was a horrible individual. But at the end of the day, there's a mom that lost a son, and there's a legitimate grief in that. Where does she go in Cleveland to find unbiased support because of her last name? Disenfranchised grief is grief that we can't talk about. When I started in this field 35 years ago, AIDS was a disenfranchised grief. You never told anybody your son died of AIDS. You said he died of cancer or he died of pneumonia uh, because it was so disenfranchised. Unfortunately, we've moved the needle on that a little bit. 
We still need to move the needle on suicide and some other mental health issues, uh, but disenfranchised grief. So what's our goal? What are we trying to do when we're helping people with loss? The first one is just to accept the reality of the loss, accept the reality of the changes happening in our lives right now because of COVID-19. Um, that seems like a simple thing to do, and I'm telling you it's not. It is a really, really difficult process of truly coming to grips with the fact that your life has changed, like life as we know it has changed, right? Because you can understand something intellectually in your head, but understanding it in your heart is a completely different thing. And so that difference between your head and your heart, that argument between your head and your heart is how grief plays itself out for people. So the reality is uh, my husband died of a heart attack, let's say, but man, I don't wanna believe that. I don't wanna believe that I'm never gonna see him again. So that argument back and forth of, okay, I know my husband's died because I saw a body in a casket, but man, I don't want to think he has. How that plays itself out in real life is that if I had dinner on the table for the two of us every night for 50 years, uh, for a few weeks after he dies, I'm still going to have two plates on the table at 5 o'clock because that's, I half, half expect him to walk through the door. Intellectually, I know he's not going to, but man, in my heart, I hope he does. And that's grief. If you've lost a loved one and two months later you pick up your cell phone, you're dialing the phone because I'm going to tell mom X, Y, Z, and the phone's ringing before you realize, oh, yeah, no, wait, I can't call mom, right? That's the argument between your head and your heart, what your head knows to be true, what your heart doesn't want to believe. Um, in the end, who wins is your head. Your head has to win because you can't bring somebody back from the dead. So grief is a process of your heart coming into alignment with what your head knows to be true. And that's a really tough part. Um, it could take a year and a half to two years to get through kind of this first step of grief. Um, I know that's not good news if you're grieving, but, but somebody started this lie a long time ago. You've probably heard it says it takes a year to grieve. And that really is what it is, that's a big fat lie, because it takes so much longer. That first year, you're just numb for the most part. You're walking through the motions. And for those of you who are experiencing loss out because of the COVID response, you know that. You're just kind of every day marching through your day, going through the because of the, of the numbing effect of what you're seeing. That first year, though, you get through the first uh, holidays without your loved one, the first anniversary of your death, and you think, phew, I got through it. I'm good to go. Year two is we're ready. And year two often is very much feels harder. It isn't harder, but it feels that way. And if you think about having a hip replacement, fortunately, I've never had one, but I hear they're very painful. When you come out of surgery, though, you're thinking, all right, this is tolerable because you've got morphine in your system, you've still got some anesthetic in your system, and you're laying quietly in your bed, and the room is dark, and you, it feels manageable. But the next day when they get you up in physical therapy and make you stand on that hip, ah, the pain's getting worse. The pain isn't really getting worse. You're just feeling it for the first time, right, because the anesthetic's wearing off, and they're cutting back on the morphine, and you're standing on your hip. It's the same thing in our grief. That first year we think, this is tolerable, I could get through it. The second year, sometimes it feels more difficult. It's because you're feeling things on a different level because that numbness, uh, that natural anesthetic is starting to wear off. To wear off excuse me. Uh, our goal is finding the new normal. A lot of people don't like that term, the new normal. I want it to go back to normal the way it was, but I don't have a magic wand and we can't do that. So what we have to figure out is what's normal going to look like for us now? What is that new normal that we're experiencing? So if new normal uh, with this crisis was I worked in an office, now my new normal is I'm working from home. And my new more normal now is my kids are at school because, I'm sorry, my kids are at home because the schools are closed. In grief, figuring out that new normal looks like this. My spouse died. I go to the grocery store. I'm going to apply for a credit card. And I'm filling out the application that says marital status. Check marital status. All right. I don't feel single. I'm technically not married. I'm not divorced. I hate the term widow. So I don't know what to check. I don't know which box to check. And people will stand there for 15 minutes on that one question. They don't know what to check. Um, that's figuring out the new normal. Who am I? If you lost a child and you meet somebody, say, oh, nice to meet you. How many kids do you have? How do you answer that? Do you say, I have three kids? Do you say, I have two kids that living in one in heaven, do I say I have two kids? How do you answer those questions? That's all about figuring out the new normal for you as a grieving person. And, and how you answer those questions is going to be different 
depending on the situation that you're in, um, depending on the circumstances that you're in, but figuring out who am I now? Um, if you took care of your spouse for five years as they died of Parkinson's and from the moment that they got up to went to bed, you were a caregiver, and when they died, who am I now? I'm not a caregiver. How do I identify myself? What do I do with myself? It's big. Figuring out that new normal is that next kind of big chunk. And I would say that the goal of survival for all of us in grief care and in, in this crisis right now is survival. At some point, it's just about how do we survive it. Um, you know, they say time heals all wounds, and, and I don't think that's totally true. I think time doesn't do anything but tick by. It's what you do with the time that's helpful. But on some level, some of this survival is just about time. It's just about it's painful right now if you've just lost a loved one, and it does get better uh, with some work but also with some time. Just ticking some time away is very helpful. But our goal here is how do we survive? Does it get better? People ask me this all the time. Will it get any better? And I'm all about being honest with people because I think we can survive anything if people are honest with us. Um, and so what I say, no, it, it doesn't get better. It gets different, right? Because better means my life is back to the way it was. It's back to a, a normal caseload. It's back to having my loved one back in my life. It, it, we can't do that. So it doesn't necessarily get better. It gets different, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. So what we like to see happen is that if I'm the container and my grief is that black dot, that over time the grief diminishes. Over time, the first year, the second year, the grief gets smaller and smaller and smaller until finally it goes away. I don't think that's what happens. I think this is what happens. I think that our grief stays the same, but our capacity to hold it gets bigger. Our capacity is what changes, not the grief. People who were initially briefed tell me that it's, it's like if you put your hand in front of your face, uh, it's like it just takes your breath away. It's, oh, this, it's overwhelming. It's, it's engulfing you. At some point, if you slide your hand right around to your ear, uh, the grief just kind of slides to the side, and you're able to be functional in life again. But when you hear the song you dance to at your wedding, it's right back in front of your face, and you have a moment, you cry, you process that emotion, and it gets tucked away neatly again by your ear, and then a few days later, you pass the restaurant that you always went to with your loved one, and it's right back in your face, and you have a moment, and you cry, and then it gets tucked away. But your, your loved one never leaves you. The grief never fully leaves you. But again, your capacity to hold it and manage it is what changes. So hopefully that makes sense. There is not one right way to grieve. We talked about some of the variables in grief. Uh, there are a couple of wrong ways. If you tell me that you are drinking a jug of whiskey every night to grieve, you know, I'd say that's probably not a healthy way. If you're thinking of hurting yourself, that's clearly not a healthy way. But having said that, there's not one right way to do this, okay? Um, in support groups for loss, you'll hear Mrs. Jones say, um, I go to the cemetery every morning and I talk to my husband for an hour. And I'll say, great, does that work for you? Oh, yes, I can't imagine not starting my day that way. It just makes me feel so close to my husband. And I say, great, keep doing it. You found what works for you. Mrs. Smith will say, oh, my God, I'd never go to the cemetery. That creeps me out. I talk to the picture on the mantle every morning. Okay, Mrs. Smith, does that work for you? Oh, yeah, it makes me feel so close to him. I can't imagine not starting my day. Great, keep doing it, right? We don't have to all do the same thing. We have to do what works for us. A part of what grief counseling is about is figuring out what is working for you and what is helping for you. Because journaling may be great for you, but maybe not so much for me. Or physical exercise might be great for me, but not so much for you. Figuring out. What is the thing that's helping you cope is the key here. This is a chart that I give sometimes to clients who are stuck in their grief. Um, and there's always a reason people get stuck. Um, why would somebody be stuck in their grief and not want to move forward? A couple of reasons. If they're getting something out of it, right? I have had sometimes widows, people who've lost their husband, and when that happens, the kids all come around, and they bring meals every day, and they're bringing their grandbabies over. And there's tons of, you know, fellowship and people and food. And the widow, you know, mom loves that. Well, a couple months later, when everybody kind of goes back to their life, mom's feeling very, very lonely. But if she plays that, you know, sad, grieving widow kind of card, the kids still come around. So we talk about, you know, that need for companionship, for interaction, for fellowship. That's so legitimate. But is there a way we can get that need met without you staying in an unhealthy way in your grief, 
Um, people stay stuck because they feel guilty about something. They feel guilty maybe about how the person died. Maybe they felt responsible. And so they feel like if I move through my grief um, towards resolution, then that, that means uh, that, you know, my loved one died in vain. Or people feel like um, if, I, if I move through grief and then if I'm happy again, it means I didn't love my loved one. There's lots of reasons that people stay stuck. And if you want to unstick them, you've got to see why they're stuck. So I give them this chart that says, are you happy? If they say yes, if you follow down the left-hand side, uh, then keep doing whatever you're doing because you're happy, right? I would submit to you that those people aren't sitting in my office, though. The people that are usually sitting in my office, when I say, are you happy, they say no. The next question is, do you want to be happy, right? Because guess what? It's a free country. You don't have to be happy if you don't want to. If they say no, they don't want to be happy, then I would say, Keep doing whatever you're working you're doing because it's working, right? You're not happy. Uh, but again, you're probably not sitting in my office. If I say, do you want to be happy, and they say yes, then the magic key here is that you have to change something. Because what you're doing to cope right now isn't working. That's why you're not happy. And so again, that's the goal of how do we figure out with them what is the, the thing that's going to help them cope, help them move through this process, help them express their grief, help them come to a point where uh, figuring out that new normal, that new reality, and being able to be uh, not just living, but and not just existing, but actually living. That's the goal that we want for them. Right. So I don't know if any of you have seen the TV show. It's off the air now. It's in syndication, Big Bang Theory. And I love the Big Bang Theory. Um, Sheldon Cooper, it, basically it's about a bunch of scientists that are nerds. Uh, they're brilliant, but they don't have any social skills. And one of the main characters, Sheldon Cooper, they asked him one time, um, Sheldon, you need to get out of your comfort zone. And he said, why? They call it a comfort zone for a reason. It's really, really comfortable in here. Um, I would submit to you that the magic always happens outside of your comfort zone and the grief resolution always happens outside of your comfort zone. For you to really process what this means to grieve and to lose and to, to move forward in, in your life, you have to get out of your comfort zone. That's really the only way to do it. And so, again, that's part of, of what we do here at Cornerstone. So let's talk a little bit about COVID-19. Really, little is known right now um, about the pandemic's long-term effects on mental health. We're, we're making some assumptions. Um, the, um, there was an article in the Washington Post recently that said nearly half of Americans report that the coronavirus is harming their mental health. Um, and that um, the, the other thing they said was the people in emotional distress registered more than a 1,000% increase in April compared with the same year, the same time last year. So what we know is that the coronavirus is increasing our mental health issues. It is causing depression. Um, it is causing panic. It is causing a lot of things. And so we haven't looked even really fully at what it's doing to mental health. We're solely focused on the physical health because obviously until we get a vaccine and a treatment and a cure, uh, that's the, the, the thing that we need to focus on. But at some point, we have to take a look at what this is doing to our mental health. Psychological stress is not limited by geography. Um, when you look at historically in our country, when things like 9-11, when the, the Twin Towers are hit, or Hurricane Katrina, those kind of issues uh, that had a grief and loss we're all based on a region or geography. And so 9-11, I mean, I think all of us that were alive then um, will remember exactly where we were, who we were with, what we were wearing, the moment we first saw the, the visual image on TV of the Twin Towers being hit. It was an incredibly sad visual. But I don't know anybody in New York. I don't know anybody who lives there. So it really wasn't psychologically distressing for me in the same way that if you had a loved one living in New York, you wouldn't know were they okay or not necessarily. In Hurricane Katrina, again, horrible, horrible event, sad and devastating. But those people were, were without homes, without electricity, without water, you know. In my part of the country, including where I live, they, it didn't affect me in that same way. What we're seeing, though, is that COVID-19 is affecting everybody. It is not limited by a certain location. So hopefully that, that makes sense. In, at Case Western, they have a study, or they have a center for trauma and adversity, and they did a study and found that 94% of people right now experiencing this COVID uh, pandemic experienced or reported symptoms of grief. And those symptoms of grief are going to be loss and crying and sadness and 
pit in your stomach and all kinds of stuff. 94% right now of who they surveyed, and if we extrapolate that to the country, 94% of us are experiencing symptoms of grief. That is huge, it's huge. So what are we grieving for with, uh, with this response? So we're grieving life as we knew it. Like we're grieving the fact that, I'm grieving personally the fact that the hair salons aren't open and I'm desperate for a dye job, right? Uh, we're grieving the normal the ability to go out and go to the store without wearing a mask. We're grieving the fact that, you know, I don't know how to homeschool my kids, but they're home with me. We're grieving the fact that um, extra curriculums, my, my daughter graduated from college, there's no commencement this year at all. So I'm grieving the fact that she doesn't get to put a cap and gown on. We're grieving life as we knew it. And even when we get through this pandemic, and they're saying maybe a year to 18 months, it's still not, life's still not going to go back to normal, still not going to go back to the way it was before this hit. For many people out there, you're grieving, a lot, you've lost your job. Or if you were a waiter in a, in a restaurant or you cut hair or a bar, like you've lost your job because none of those things can be open. Many people have lost their income, you know, because of, of again, jobs. We're losing fellowship. And you see on social media and TV, you know, these birthday parties that are drive through where you just kind of drive through your, by your grandparents' house and they wave at you and leave the gift on the front yard for you and you grab it and, and move on. Just that social isolation of not being able to be with family and friends is huge, especially if you're an extrovert. If you're an introvert, maybe you're not as affected by this, but um, the, the ability to be with people, to, to go to your place of worship, whatever your faith is, to you can just go to the grocery store just to, to have a cup of coffee. We've lost all that, so we're grieving all of that. We're also grieving a sense of security. You know, okay, the stock's going to go up and down. What's my finances going to be like? Is it going to be safe to go outside without a mask? Is it, uh, you know, what if I run out of, you know, hand gel? It's just that sense of security and how we do life. All these things we're grieving right now. All these things we're grieving. First responders, and I call you all first responders. First responders, in my mind, aren't just police and fire. They're the people on the front lines that are doing the hard work of this, of caring for people that have COVID-19, and that includes all of you. It includes nurses and doctors and people that work in hospitals, the receptionists, anybody that's in that field. It includes all of you. So how are you being affected? caseloads right now, especially in hot zones like New York, uh, your caseloads are just incredibly, you know, so much higher than you're used to. As I mentioned before, people who you maybe worked on a unit where you lost one or two patients a week and now you're losing 10 and 15 a day. I know for many of you I understand that work in the, in the renal centers that your patients have been moved to other areas and you're, they're filling your facilities with COVID patients. So just the case of changing, even who you're seeing. So if you've worked in one area of nursing or medicine or therapy for years and all of a sudden the patients are different, it's not so quick for, you know, an oncologist to become an obstetrician. Like you, you, your caseloads are changing like that. So that's a big, big difference. Your work hours, I imagine for many of you, have changed. If you are on the front lines, your work hours may be really, really long. If, you, if your job has been cut because of, of this, your work hours have changed uh, dramatically the other way. What we don't know about this yet or what we anticipate is going to happen is this second wave with all of you first responders on the front line, this a second wave of depression and maybe increased suicide rates is going to happen because you could only be in a crisis for so long without having a break and there's no break that has been especially I think of the, the people in New York that are working in the hospitals around the clock. They can't go home because they can't, you know, they're just social distancing from their family. What they're anticipating is that the depression rate is going to go up and the suicide rate is going to go up. So it's really, really important for you all as people on the front line to get support. And we're going to talk a little bit about how and where to do that. But you need to be able to, to have some support because we don't want you to be affected by that depression rate, by those increased things that we're going to be seeing. Cumulative loss. What that is, and that's what you guys may be experiencing, is multiple deaths at the same time or in serial fashion. Um, so again, if you think about those people in New York that you see on TV, those hospitals, 
um, multiple deaths at the same time, they're, they're bearing thousands and thousands there, or in serial fashion. So if you were working in a nursing facility, let's say, and Mrs. Smith dies, even though without the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic, Mrs. Smith dies, so her bed's not even cold, they place somebody else in that bed. And if you're working in hospice, let's say, you know, you, you lose a patient that you're, even in, even in the renal field that you're in, you lose a patient you've been working with for years, and then you lose another patient, and then you lose another patient. You don't even get to fully grieve one loss before you've had another loss, and another loss, and another loss. And that's grief overload. Nobody can manage that without some support, a multiple deaths. So cumulative loss often occurs in hospitals or hospice facility, may lead to bereavement overload or what has been called cumulative grief, again, just more and more and more deaths. Cumulative grief is the caregiver's response when there's no time or opportunity to completely or adequately grieve for each person who's died. And again, if you are in working in this field, you're seeing that happen, multiple deaths without the time to process. Cumulative loss is bouncing back and forth between the stages of grief without resolution. So you can start feeling sad that your client died that you've worked with for three years, you know, four or five times a week, you've done dialysis on them and they die. And then you don't even have really have time to grieve that and then you lose another patient and you lose another patient. And so that you were angry and now you're back to sad again and you're starting to get some resolution and now you're back to sad again. That balancing back and forth between the stages of grief is really, really difficult. Traumatic loss. So this, you know, we talked about cumulative grief, cumulative trauma is what many of you are experiencing right now with the COVID uh, situation that's going on. Just the trauma that you see over and over and over. Vicarious trauma is just kind of reliving somebody's trauma. And even if you didn't see something traumatic, if you hear about it enough times, you start having some of those trauma symptoms. If you are, we have um, at Cornerstone of Hope where I work, we have a lot of support groups. And we have, for example, a murder loss group. So if your loved one died by homicide or was murdered, you're eligible to come to that group. If you're the facilitator and you just heard 14 murder stories, you know, we want to make sure you're okay before you leave the building because the, the chance of vicarious trauma reliving that's really, really high. Of trauma, I would also say there was a perception, and you guys probably all know this, it's not an event. There's no such thing as a traumatic event. Trauma is always in how your brain perceives that event. For example, I talked about 9-11. Um, yeah, again, I, it was a very sad thing to, to witness, a horrible thing, but it wasn't traumatic for me because I don't know anybody in New York. But if you did and you didn't know if your loved one got out of the Twin Towers and for a period of hours you were wondering, that's traumatic for you. So it's trauma isn't always, is always in how your brain perceives an event. The good news about that is that we can change perceptions, right? You're, we can train your brain to think differently. One of the um, interventions that we use here at Cornerstone is called EMDR. It's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And so it, it, um, it uses tapping and light beams to rethink the left and right hemisphere of your brain, and they process that event that was traumatic in a way that you perceive it as no longer trauma. And I'm doing a, a horrible injustice to the, the wonderful uh, therapeutic intervention that it is by how I'm explaining it. But for example, I have a, um, a client who, um, son knocked on the door uh, of her house. She said, come in. He came in and shot her, but she didn't die. Uh, he was, uh, had mental health issues. He was later killed uh, by the police. And so intellectually, she knows he's died because she sees, she saw him, you know, a body in a casket. But every time she hears this, a knock on the door, she panics and it sent her right back into that, oh my gosh, somebody's gonna come in and shoot me, that big perception of trauma. So she, I don't do EMDR, but I sent her to one of our therapists here that does. And she came back after five sessions and said, Julie, I can hear this knocking all day long, it doesn't bother me. Because they retrained her brain when you hear the knocking, you don't go to that place of, of your son's eye. So it's a very, very effective intervention. Again, trauma um, is something that is very, very important to treat along with the grief. Um, traumatic loss, though, can also lead to cynicism. If we don't deal with it, and, and probably all of you um, know a coworker or a colleague or somebody who is just their cynical, they just are just the glass half empty, kind of pessimistic kind of person, very often those people are just burnt out. They simply are just burnt out, and it's really hard to bounce back from that kind of burnout. So 
so we hope that we provide you know good self care before we get to that point. Okay, the blind man and the elephant. I'm just looking at my time. I'm going to speed it up here. Um, probably most of you have heard Aesop's fable, the blind, seven blind men and the elephant. But in case you haven't, here's a very rough paraphrase. Um, there was a man who had an elephant, and seven blind men came along, and he asked each of them, "Tell me what an elephant is like. What's an elephant?" And so the, the blind man that touched the side of the elephant said, "Oh, an elephant's like a brick wall. It's really sturdy, you know." And the blind man that touched the leg said, "Oh." An elephant's like a tree trunk, it's, you know, and the one that touched the tail said, oh, an elephant's like a rope, and you get the point. Um, the point being that all of them were partially right, but all of them were still partially wrong, right, because they didn't have the whole picture of who the elephant was. What I would say about grief is very similar, that there are different ways of looking at grief as we process through this time. There are people that are looking at this time like, a, you know, a tragedy, or they see Death is a tragedy, and there are other people who see, you know, it's just a passage in life, and it's they, my loved one's gone on to heaven, and I'm good. There are people that see grief as liberation from pain. If their loved one was an addict um, or had physical pain from, you know, being having cancer or being in hospice, that sometimes death is just it's freeing. Um, same with somebody whose loved one has Alzheimer's. Coming to terms with a terrible process. Some people see it as a relief. There are people that have lost uh, loved ones that just, phew, it's a relief because they, they feel like their loved one's out of pain. There are some spiritual um, cultures and spiritualities that believe that if I suffer now, I won't suffer in the afterlife. So, man, they don't ask for the pain medicine because they're okay with a little bit of suffering, believing that they're going to not suffer in the afterlife. So that suffering is good. What we want to find out with the people that we work with is how they are processing or how they're staying uh, this kind of grief, because we all see it a little bit differently. So when stress levels rise, self-care tends to decline, and we need to make sure that we're taking ourselves. So I would ask you, how many of you right now feel like this, right? On empty. What I tell people is that your car has a gas tank, right? And if there's no gas in the tank, the car doesn't go. You can have the most beautiful BMW with leather interiors and all the bells and whistles, it don't matter. If there's no gas in the tank, the car doesn't go. And it's the same thing for us as, as care, professional caregivers. If there's no gas in our tanks, we all have a physical tank, a spiritual tank, and an emotional tank. If our tanks are empty, we don't go. We quit. Our bodies quit, right? And so what that looks like is, is individual. So you need to figure out. You know, physically, what fills your tank? Is it sitting and reading a good book, or is it going jogging? Emotionally, what fills that tank? Spiritually, what fills your tank so that you can get up again and go do the hard work that you're doing? But if we don't take care of ourselves, it is not a luxury. It is a necessity. If we don't do that, we that's when we burn out, and then we're no good to anybody. And then the quarantine reality is this <laughs> for some of you. Uh, you're still going to work, but your kids are home from school now, and you are juggling you know, kids and food and meals and work, and, and it's crazy making. If we don't fill our tanks, we burn out. And then I love this because you would never let your phone get to this point, right? So why do we let ourselves get to the point where we're not charged up and ready to go? Self-care is so, so important in this process. So how does caregiving during a pandemic affect your life? Uh, in a couple ways, being a professional caregiver. One is decision fatigue. Now, how many of you can relate to this? You're exhausted, you've worked a double shift, you go home, the kids are crying, and your husband says, what's for dinner, right? And you just think, oh my gosh, I'll make anything you want, just tell me what to make. Like having to make one more decision is horrible, right? Decision fatigue. We know we're at that point of burnout when we can't make decisions like that, but it's so normal. Find your tribe in all this, and your tribe may not be your biological family, but find the people that understand what you do, that may be on the front lines with you, who can, who can be your, your person that can listen and understand. I would say, when I, my dad's a PhD engineer, and when I graduated with my social work degree, my dad said this to me, so they're going to pay you to just talk to people? And I say, dad, it's not talking to people, it's counseling, like it's a field, it's a legitimate you know, field. And he didn't, didn't get it. So much as I love my dad, he was never my go-to person if I was struggling with a work issue or counseling um, because he didn't get it, right? You've got to find people who get what you do, who understand why you stay in the trenches, who 
who understand the hard, hard work that you're doing because they're the ones who are going to be able to support you. So find, find those people. Work-life balance, I think that's an oxymoron. I think there's no such thing as work-life balance because work because balance means 50-50 in my mind. It means we give 50% of our time to work and 50% of our time to work outside of work. And I don't think that's ever is. I think it's 100-100. I think that when we are at work, we give 100%. But that means that when we go home, we give 100% at home. It means we don't answer our emails at home and we don't take phone calls. But figuring out what that balance is like for you, I don't think it's 50-50, it's important. Because when you're at home, you should be all in. Just like when you're at work, you're all in. Media consumption is really uh, critical because we can, like it can make or break my day watching what goes on, uh, watching the news. I used to watch the news at night religiously because I loved trying to figure out what was going on with the government and understanding. And I was getting so mad and scream at the TV. And so now, like how self-care for me is all about not watching the news because I don't get mad anymore. Um, so just watching what you're taking in is really, really uh, key for this. And then mind your addictions. So we all have them. They're not all alcohol and drugs. But are you addicted to your smartphone? You know, do you have it on all night and you're, you know, watching and doing things and not getting a good night's sleep? Are you addicted to being right? all the time. Are you addicted? Whatever, we all have addictions, so find out what those are and make sure we're managing those. And then if all else fails, remember that stress spelled backwards is desserts, and you definitely can't go wrong with dessert, right? This is the last slide, and then we'll see what questions that you guys have. Um, this is what I see our role is as professional caregivers. It's kind of hard to see, but the gentleman on the left, it's raining only on him. It's kind of like those um, rain clouds where it's, you know, cloudy and rainy all the way over Ziggy, you know, but it's sunshine and rainbows every, everywhere else. So many times I hear people, I hear uh, clinicians and interns saying, oh, I want to make them stop suffering because it's really, really hard to sit with people who are suffering, right? And even in, in your life before the pandemic when you're sitting with people who are in dialysis, they're suffering on some level. But really now when you're sitting with people who are, um, have COVID, who can't have their families with them, who may be dying without their love, you're in your it. You're with people who are suffering, and it's really, really hard to stay there sometimes. Um, I can't make anybody stop suffering. I can't take that suffering because the last I checked, I wasn't God. And thank goodness, because I'd screw things up if I was. But what I can do to somebody is hand them an umbrella. So if you think about if, if it's raining on that gentleman, what does handing him an umbrella do? Now the rain's not beating down on his head. Now it's beating down on an umbrella. It cushions the blow a little bit. Does the umbrella make the rain go away? No. He doesn't have the ability to make it stop raining, but he can hand him an umbrella. I see our role as handing people umbrellas, spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, physically if you're a, you know, a nurse or a caregiver in that way, but giving them the tools they need, physically, spiritually, emotionally, to deal with the suffering to lessen, that's my job. Give them the umbrella, give them the tools they need to work through this. If, but if I think I can make them stop suffering, I think higher myself than I should because I don't have any ability to do that. So hopefully that, so I think we should all be out there handing out umbrellas. So with that, um, I think that Deb and Sue are gonna see if there's any questions that anybody has. Thank you so much, Julia. We really appreciate your talk. And I learned quite a bit here too, listening. Um, I do have one question here. Um, it is, is it hard to self-care when coping mechanisms are closed or prohibited? Yes, it is very hard to self-care. And I will tell you, uh, my, I told you, my first self-care is uh, going to, to TJ Maxx or Target. And I don't have to buy anything. Just walking around just clears my head. I just like to look at pretty things. But the other thing, um, do you know a great clips for five bucks, they wash your hair for you. And I learned this when I had foot surgery and I couldn't get in the shower. I went to great clips and I don't get my hair cut there, but for five bucks, they wash your hair. And I love having somebody just scrub my head. It just, like I lay there for 20 minutes and it's the best thing. And they're closed. So my two forms of self-care are closed right now. So it's really hard. So I have to figure out other ways to do that. Um, and I figured out how to just sit quietly and read how to um, deep breathing. If you do any kind of meditation or yoga, you can do that on your own. Um, for some people, they're in an area where it's, you know, it's not right in the sea. They can go out for a walk and not be around people. 
going out for a walk and breathing the air. So absolutely it's hard to do that, but we still have to figure out how to do that because when you're on an airplane and they tell you if the oxygen pressure, you know, goes low and the mask drops out, put on yours first before you help the elderly person with the baby, they do that for a reason. Because if you're not breathing, you can't help anybody else. So yes, it is hard, but with creativity, you have to find a way to, to, to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. Yeah, good question. Well, currently we have no more questions, but I would like to say that I think that's probably because everybody is taking in so much of your information and internalizing it and making it real for them right now. And I think that that's a really good sign as well. Good. So, well, let me tell you just real quickly then the, how you can get a hold of me if anybody has any questions and wants to talk um, otherwise. Cornerstone of Hope, we are a bereavement center. We are in Independence, which is Cleveland, Ohio, but we have telehealth. So we can see clients virtually through um, a telehealth program that we have that's completely confidential and HIPAA approved. So if anybody is in person and wants to talk to a counselor about all this grief or come to a support group, you're more than welcome to. If you're not in the Cleveland area, we can do it via telehealth. Uh, we also have memorial events. So some people weren't able to have you know, a funeral or memorial program for their loved one who died, we can certainly help with that. And then our contact information is there. So if we can serve anybody anywhere in the country, we are more than happy to do that. We'd love to do that. Julia, I have, there's another question here, and this is from Carrie. Um, do you have, do you have a, a validation phrase or approach when speaking to someone who is really starting to unravel to the struggles with the pandemic? Somebody, I'm assuming somebody who's not sick. I don't, somebody who, I don't who's know with it. for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing I tell every client that I see, the first thing I say is, it's nice to meet you, but I'm sorry I have to. Because if I have to meet you, that means they've had a loss. But the second thing I tell everybody is this, this is survivable. I think that's what I would say to somebody who's really struggling with the, the pandemic, that this is survivable for most of us. This is, it's, it's inconvenient. I can't get my, my gray roots dyed. I can't get out to the gym. I can't go to my favorite restaurant. We still have electricity and food and water and, and a roof over our heads. Um, so for, for a lot of us, for some people, it really affects us differently because it's affecting our income and we're losing money. And, and for those of you on the front lines that we've talked about, you're, you know, you're working really, really hard. Uh, but I think the same answer goes to this is survivable. We'll get through this. We're going to be different people because of it, but but it's survivable. This is survivable. Well, that concludes our program for today. Right. And I really, um, really am very appreciative to Julia for spending this time with us. And we hope that you all took a tidbit back to help you through these um, difficult new normal times. And thank you very much. All right, thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you, Julia. Bye-bye.